We are going to look at Genesis chapter 16. So, today, we are, uh, today we are going, today we are going to look at, wait for it, <laughs> patience. Do you have any? Did I just make you lose it? If you have any, I'd love to borrow some from you. Patience. And as we look at Hagar's story, we've been studying heroes of the faith. Hagar is our hero for this morning. Hagar is a fascinating person. Dr. Alexander White says this about Hagar. Hagar, by reason of the extremity of her sorrow, and by reason of her desolateness and brokenness, and by reason of the sovereign grace and abounding mercy of our God, Hagar, I say, stands out before us in the very foremost rank of faith. He saw Hagar as a hero. Now we don't know a whole lot about her, but there's a legend with good sources that says was, that Hagar was the daughter of Pharaoh, the same Pharaoh that, you remember, Abram uh, went to Egypt because of the, you know, he went to Egypt because God directed him to, there was famine and all these things going on. He's in Egypt and he lies to Pharaoh about his wife Sarai and that whole thing. He tells this lie and it was that same Pharaoh who gave Abram all these gifts and really blessed him in that way. But Hagar, the legend goes, got so attached to Sarai that she decided to stop being a princess in a palace and become a servant to Sarai. And so she left all that and kind of put herself into that position. And over time, Sarai led her to faith in God. And she believed and trusted God and followed Abram and his family on that journey of faith. And so from Hagar, we can learn something really important. We can learn the power of patience and yet the problems that come with impatience. So that's our focus. And I need this message because <laughs> I'm not naturally patient. It's a hard thing for me to, to learn and, and to embrace. I am in that category of people that might pray, God, give me patience, but can you please hurry up about it? <laughs> That's kind of where I would fall. But from Hagar, this person of faith, and the story that is told about her and her situation, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from her and her own interaction with Abram and Sarai in the story that we've been working our way through in Genesis. Now, meanwhile, Abram and Sarai are waiting. They're waiting and waiting, still waiting on the promises of God to come true. Remember, God has said several times to Abram, your offspring, your kids, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And yet Abram is 80 years old now, and they're still waiting. And so with that, look at Genesis chapter 16, and I'll read the first three verses to get us into this story. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, and so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so go and sleep with my slave, and perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took the Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Can you hear the impatience there? Can you hear the lack of patience in God fulfilling his promises? Sarai is really tired of waiting. She is really feeling like she's getting too old to have kids, and so she comes up with a plan. She comes up with her own plan because 
of her impatience and it causes all kinds of problems. Let me just pause, maybe you can relate to that. What causes you to be impatient? What is it for you? Have you noticed the things that are that trigger for you that just causes you that moment of, I can't endure what it's requiring me to be patient in this situation. Like somebody sitting in a stoplight and you can turn right on red, but they didn't get the memo. You're just waiting. Or driving behind. Is it, is it driving for you? It sometimes what pushes my button. It's like I have someplace I, I want to be. And I'm behind somebody going 25 and a 45 and I get impatient. And I need to recognize that. Well, what is that for you that pushes that button of impatience for you? Uh, waiting on people, standing in line. Uh, what is it? Some kind of an interruption that just interrupts the agenda that you have for the moments ahead of you? What is it that causes your impatience? Because I think if you're honest, we all struggle with it in some way. We just have these feelings of impatience in the circumstances or in the, in the people around us. Sarai and Abram got impatient waiting for the promise of these children. And in their impatience, it causes broken relationships and all kinds of problems. And they have probably, I would assume, done what we can sometimes do and justified our impatience by thinking things like, well, you know, God wants us to do our part. Maybe I just need to step it up and do my part so God can do his part. I mean, you know, we do our best and then God does the rest. Or that statement that maybe you've heard, well, you know, God helps those who help themselves. But honestly, I've never seen that in the Bible. But I have seen a lot of God helps the helpless. God helps those who are so broken and so struggling with patience that they cry out to God for help knowing that they don't have what it takes to get it. That's the thing about patience. And our impatience can help us to get to that place of depending on God, who himself is the source of patience. God alone can give us the kind of patience that we need in daily life. You know, we've talked about heroes of the faith and how they were fruitful. Galatians 5 kind of fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience. It's the fruit of the Spirit that only can come from God. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 describes love. It, it tells what love is. And it really starts out in that description, love is patient. We know that the kind of love we need in life only can come from God, his love in us. The patience that we need in life can only come from God. He's the only genuine source of it. Being patient doesn't mean I white knuckle it and just kind of wait and, until things happen the way I'm hoping they'll happen. And it's not just sitting around and twiddling my thumbs. Patience comes as its source in God and recognizing that only he can bring it. That to me is liberating to know that I don't have to come up with it. I don't have to manufacture it. Patience is only going to come as God gives it to me, as God brings it to me. And I just learn to celebrate his presence in the moment, whatever that moment is, and wait on him and pray with him and talk to him and wait for him to bring the patience I need in the moment. So consider with me a couple of causes of impatience that comes out in this story. The things that spark the impatience, there, there's a lot of causes for it, but here's a few that come out in Genesis chapter 16. We can get impatient because of an unfilled, unfulfilled desire. And that desire might even be a good one. Sarai desperately wanted a child. In that culture, in that culture, having lots of kids was a sign of blessing. It was a sign of being under God's blessing. Not having any kids was a bad thing. And so Sarai is struggling with this. And she's becoming impatient. She knew God's pro promises, but time was running out. And she stepped in and came up with a plan. Now, you know, in Abram's day, it was a custom that if a woman, a wife, could not bear the husband, a child, then it was an acceptable thing in that culture that the servant, the maid, could provide and become a second wife 
for the man and bear children in that way. And this was a custom man, not, not a blessing and, and something ordained by God. God's heart and will has always been for one man, one wife. But she stepped in according to the culture of that day and came up with this plan. And it was because she had this unfulfilled desire that was too difficult for her in that setting to, to wait for. Her motive was, you know, kind of right, but her method was absolutely wrong. And we can make the same mistake. We can step in because of an unfulfilled desire or need or expectation and make things happen. We can do that particularly in a culture like ours that we're free and we have credit cards and we can make things happen. We can do things and really we can do things without God's help and that's a little scary. We desperately need God's help. Unfulfilled desires can cause us to meet our own needs our own way rather than waiting on God's perfect timing. And this really comes down to an issue of trust. Do I really trust God to meet my needs? Do I really trust God to provide what I desire in a way that is matching up with his timing and his desire for me? We can get ahead of God. And it's important to note that patience isn't just waiting for something that I want. It's really trusting God to bring me what I need and to do for me what only he can do when he wants to do it. That's a trust issue. It's a belief issue. And it's definitely a challenge. We find ourselves in those places where we want to step out and do it. And kind of, we wouldn't say this, but kind of help God out. So here's an idea. Psalm 37 verse 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in him. Delight yourself in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So when we put our trust in him, and when we find our delight in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. And even beyond that, he puts those desires in us, those desires that are better. How many times... I hope you can relate to this. How many times I have thought I had this good desire and I wanted God to fulfill it and I realized that God had a different, better, deeper desire for me in mind. And when I delight in him in that, I get better things, blessings out of it because my desires matched up with his. So here's a thought, a suggestion. When you're feeling impatient in the moment, ask this question. What is my desire in this? What is my perceived need at this moment? What is my expectation right now? Or if you're the recipient of somebody being impatient toward you, or you're trying to bless somebody that is impatient about their circumstances, same question. What is their need? What do they need from me in this moment? What is the desire? What is the underlying need and desire in this that is causing the impatience and how can I help that other person or help myself in prayer to get to that place of Psalm 37 4 that my delight is in the Lord and he will put the desires in my heart he will give me the desires of my heart and then it all matches up and whatever happens is a blessing because God did it and he gives me the patience for it to wait on him for his perfect timing, so that his desires are my desires. Now, here's another reason we can get impatient, and I think this is prominent in this story. We can get impatient because of unbelief. We're believing wrongly, or we're just not believing that something is really going to happen. Wrong beliefs and thoughts can cause impatience. And so Sarai, she began to question God's promises. Maybe she thought, well, maybe I've been left out of this. Maybe the, God, maybe the promises weren't really for me. So I just have to think about the promises and my part in helping them to be fulfilled. She wanted to have many children. In verse 2, as you heard, she says, uh, you know, God really, this is your fault. It's your fault. 
that's a that's a wrong belief to think that we can blame it on God. God, this is your fault for not enabling me to have children. You you can hear the almost bitterness developing there, can't you? The impatience that is fueling this this wheel that is turning. And she says, God, this is even your fault. You promised, and now it's ha not happening. It's wrong belief and faulty thinking. And she played the blame game. And there's lots of emotion behind this for her that we, we can be sure of. She would have, you know, she was wrapped up in disappointment and sorrow and remorse and regret and a broken heart that the promises of God isn't blessing her with, with children. And she could even be thinking, you know, I've really failed my husband as a wife. And all of it is rooted in faulty thinking, wrong Believing, and we can fall into the same trap. Wrong beliefs and thoughts can cause wrong behaviors. If we're believing wrongly, we'll, what will come out is wrong choices and wrong patterns of belief that lead to actions that don't match up with God's desire, his better desire for each of us, including impatience and trying to make things happen to help God out and meeting my own needs rather than trusting God to meet my needs in his timing. So for Sarai, it was really a timing issue, right? It was an issue about timing. God's timetable was different than hers. And when we jump ahead of God's timetable, even though it might be a promise we're supposed to hold on to and wait for, when we jump ahead on God's timetable, it results in terrible consequences and problems for ourselves and for others. Read on in this story. Pick up with verse 4. So Hagar gets pregnant, and it says, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and so she fled from her. Now, don't miss something really important in this part of the story. What's up with Abram? You know, your mind, as you hear the, the words that we just read, might go back to Adam in the, in the garden, right? It's like, whatever, fruit looks good, let's eat some. Passivity. Do you hear that in Abram? Abram was very passive. Hagar comes up with this, or uh, Sarai comes up with this plan. He says, okay, do whatever you want. It's, it's okay, why not? Maybe he should have checked in with God. <laughs> Maybe he should have prayed for wisdom in what this was. Because if he would have prayed for wisdom and prayed for God's plan and God's timing, he, he would have known that, wait a minute, this choice is not what God has in mind. This choice is not best for me. This is, choice is not best for Sarai. This choice is not best for our marriage. This choice is not best for our walk of faith. That he paused to pray and seek God, but there's no appearance that he did that. It was more passivity. Okay, why not? Verse 6, it shows up again. Do what you want. Do whatever you see is best. From Abram, there's an important lesson embedded in this that we need to learn ourselves, that patience is not passivity. It's not just sitting around and waiting for things to happen or twiddling my thumbs and being passive about it. That's an important thing to know, that patience, right wisdom belief, is that patience mean I, means I continue to do what God's calling me to do. I'm not just waiting with passivity. I'm working at it. For example, if you planted some tomatoes and the tomatoes just aren't growing and somebody says, well, just be patient. Well, that doesn't mean you sit back and just wait for it to happen and not water them or weed them. It's the same for us. Patience is not being passive. Patience is still doing this journey of faith and believing that God is present with me in it and he is helping me to have the wisdom to make the right choices to be engaged with and partnering with God in the process that he is wanting to be, me to be patient for. God gives us promises, and they come forth in his perfect timing. Sarai, well, right after Hagar is pregnant, she gets angry. 
Hagar's attitude didn't really help the whole situation. She runs away from the problems. Now, this, this is another big thing that we can learn from Hagar. From Hagar, we learn that waiting, we, we can get impatient because of problems. We can get impatient because of unfulfilled desires. We can get impatient because of wrong believing. And we can get impatient because of problems that we encounter. Now, that word patient in the original Hebrew language means to bear, to suffer, to persevere. Like it says in James 1, we're considered a pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance or patience. So when we encounter problems that make us want to run away from those problems, just maybe God wants us to stay in the middle of those problems so that he can teach us something and shape us to be more like Jesus. And he fulfills the desires of my heart in his timetable, things that are so much better. And if I run from the problems, I'll miss it. I'll miss his powerful work in the problems, in the moment. Look ahead to what happens in verse 7 and 8 now. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Now, pause there for a moment. She's running away from these problems. Now listen to the question that was posed to her. Where have you come from and where are you going? Now anytime you see those kind of questions coming from God, you know, maybe it reminds you back in Genesis in the garden when they ate the, the fruit and then God said, where are you? You know, those kind of questions aren't to seek information. God knew where they were. God knows where Hagar is. God knows where she came from and where she's going. But he asked those kind of questions for the purpose of self-reflection so that we can consider, okay, where am I? And how did I get here? And where's this going to take me? Very smart and wise to pause in those moments when we're hearing some prompting from the Spirit to ask that question. Hagar does a wonderful faith modeling. She makes this beautiful choice that expresses why I would consider to be one of the heroes of faith. She's honest. She's real. She didn't make up a bunch of excuses. She just simply says, I'm running away. Hey, by the way, have you ever run away? I remember I ran away once. You know, I was in first grade, I think. And my brother and I did something. I don't remember what we did, but I knew when we were in trouble. You know, my brother um, came before my mom first and she knew what we had done. And she saw the whole thing and he first gets a swat on his behind and I knew I was next and I knew, oh, well, my punishment's probably gonna be even worse because I'm older and I should have known better. So what did I do? I bailed. <laughs> the door was right there. Didn't know where I was going. So I ran down the street to my grandma's house. What do you think grandma said? <laughs> Go back right now to your parents and straighten us out. That's really what the angel said. I don't think meanly, but the angel says, go back, go back. Sometimes running away from our problems can make it even worse. I mean, she might, she could have argued. She would have been justified in arguing. But you have no idea. This Sarai, who claims to be a follower of you, claims to be one of your children, you have no idea how she's treated me. I don't deserve that. I, there's no reason I should stay there or go back to that. But she goes back. She would have missed some really important things had she not gone back. Impatience really is your brain saying, I will never be happy until, fill in the blank. For Hagar, it was, I will never be happy until I'm as far away from Sarah as I can get. For Sarah, it would have been, I will never be happy until I have lots of kids on my own. We can fall into that same trap. I will never be happy until, and we are then crossing that line into running from our problems, not understanding what our desires are, and 
believing wrongly that God will provide for us and take us to deeper places and making us more and more like Jesus. Patience is about enjoying God in the present moment, trusting him to meet my needs and desires and expectations and alter them when that's appropriate. It's not, you know, running away, not even sure where we're going, not even for sure where we have been or what got us there. We pause, we stop, and we just reflect on the presence of God in the moment. Now, a little side note here. This is important to say, too. Sometimes it is appropriate to flee, right? Sometimes it's right to run. There are times in Scripture when God tells us to run, when he tells us to flee. You know, if there's danger, for example, if there's a semi-truck, you run out of the way if it's coming at you. If there's a bomb in a building, you get out of the building, you escape. If there's an overwhelming temptation, you flee. Joseph, in a few chapters ahead, that we'll look at him as a hero of faith. He was in a temptation moment. He fled. He ran away. An abusive situation that is dangerous for you or your child, it's appropriate to get out. There are times to flee. But when we do, we need to make sure that we've checked in with God and that it is his will for me to run and not just be running from a problem that he might want to use to grow my patience and develop me as a person who looks more and more like Jesus and helps me to grow through the problems. Remember, to be patient means to suffer and endure and to persevere. It takes problems to create that kind of an environment. This whole thing of Sarai and Hagar, there's a whole web of darkness and sin and problems in this story and it's rooted in lack of patience. It's rooted in impatience and rooted in lack of faith in God and trusting God. There's so much conflict in this story between Hagar and Sarai. So much going on behind the scenes here and conflict for us and problems in relationships are often for us because somebody wants what they want and they want it now in their own way and you're in the way of that and it can cause us problems. And we can cause those kind of problems with others if we're not careful checked in with God and prayed up and becoming more and more people of worship. You, you see, there's, there's an answer to impatience. There's something that we can do, and it's quite simple and yet profound. We just become more and more people who trust God and worship Him, even in the moment when we're getting impatient. We pause and we have these altar moments. Patience is empowered when we just stop and have an altar moment and worship the presence of God with us in this moment. He can alter our behavior at the altar. He can change our thinking. He can meet our desires. He can do powerful things that we might miss. Did we not pause and worship and trust in him? Hagar had this altar moment with God, praising and worshiping him. Look at verse 13 in this passage and how she comes out of this. She agrees to go back, verse 13. This, this is really neat what she says, and it's so powerful. Verse 13 of chapter 16. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And so this angel of the Lord, some would say, you know, well, that was Jesus, the angel of the Lord. Whatever the, the dynamics of that, it's clearly the voice of God that is speaking. And she acknowledges, I have seen the one who has seen me. El Roy means the God who sees. And she has this wonderful, powerful moment of worship. Even in her distress and her broken heart and her lack of patience for how God was going to work out, she has this worship moment and it changes everything. And we can too. We can realize that God is El Roy. He is the God who sees everything. He sees everything in my life. He knows what I'm struggling with. He knows what my desires are. He knows what my needs are. He sees it all. And yet he sees the big picture with all kinds of information that we don't have access to. We can trust him because he has our best interest in mind. And so we can be patient and wait on him celebrate his presence in the moment and depend on him to get us to the place that he wants us to be. Now, if we jump ahead 
to chapter 21. This story continues on in a really neat way. Flip ahead to chapter 21. We have this scene that unfolds, and at this point in chapter 21, Sarai's name has now been changed to Sarah, and she has this name change, and the first son is born. God is starting to fulfill his promises, and Isaac comes, and she's just filled with joy, and she was rejoicing that she has her own son now, but there's still this thing with Hagar, this unresolved conflict in their relationship. There was still a need to be patient as God worked in that and through that. In chapter 21, verses 8, 8 through 13, then Hagar's son, Ishmael, whose descendants, by the way, came to Muhammad and Islam, but that wasn't their fault. That was believing that went awry. Ishmael started to pick on to treat Isaac badly. And Sarai, again, oh, this is bad. She took matters into her own hands then, and she sent Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert with one bottle of water that Abram gave them, one flask of water, and sent them out into the desert, and they run out of water. So now she cares about her son. She puts Ishmael under a tree to die, and she goes a distance away so she wouldn't have to watch the misery of all this, dying of, of thirst. She puts him under a tree, but she has another altar moment. Listen to this in chapter 21, verse 17. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do, you, do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying and as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water, and gave the boy a drink. Well, it's just like God to show up and give more, right? Abram gave her a flask of water. God gives her a well. Unending water. His provision is more than what she could have desired. She has this wonderful altar moment with God. We too, it's, he's the same God that cares about you and I, and he cares about our needs and our desires. We too can come to him at that well, that living water, and trust in him to fill us with what he wants to fill us with and refresh us to overflowing in what he wants to put in our lives beyond what we could ever imagine or desire or need. But we have to pause, have that altar of worship, talk to him about it, pour out our hearts to him in honesty, and realize that he is a God who cares and he will provide. So we get impatient. We do get impatient because of unmet desires and unmet needs and unrealized expectations that we might have. The key to that, the key to that problem and that challenge that stirs our impatience is to stop, pause, worship God. And sometimes he alters our desires. Sometimes he gives our desires in his perfect timing. And when we know it's coming from him, wow, we enjoy it even more because we know it was his provision. We can also get impatient because of faulty beliefs, just believing wrongly. So what's the, what's the option to help with that? Have altar moments of worship with our Bibles open and realize that as we renew our minds in the power of the word, he changes our thinking and our belief system so that what comes out, our behaviors, are done out of proper thinking and beliefs that come from wisdom as we study his word and drink from this well. So when we get impatient because we're thinking wrongly about a situation, we go to his word and we search it and we're students of the word so we know what he wants and what he desires, which is going to be so much better for us me. Peter states one of the most basic and universal promises in Acts chapter 2. Listen to these words. Because sometimes, honestly, the wrong thinking that we're embracing is thinking things like, well, you know, the promises of God aren't really for me. You know, or I've done so many bad things that, you know, God's promises won't be fulfilled in my life. It's just beyond my reach. That's faulty thinking. Listen to these words that Peter expresses as one of those basic promises for all of us. He wrote this, repent, which just means turn around, change directions, 
from going your own way and meeting your own needs in your own way and according to your time. Change directions and trust in God. Turn away from that and turn to God and trust in Jesus and all that he did at the cross to express the incredible love of God to us to bring forgiveness. Repent and, and be baptized and show it. Do something visual. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons that I love baptism is just, just like Jesus modeled for us, the baptism scene and the voice of the Father, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, and, and the Holy Spirit coming like a dove in that powerful moment where the whole Trinity was involved in this visual aid. And when people put their trust in Jesus, they're living a promise that he gave to every one of us who will turn to him and believe and then understand that the Holy Spirit will fill us the Holy Spirit is the one then that will give us the gifts of the Spirit like love, joy, peace, patience. It's a fruit of the Spirit as we embrace God's promises and believe God's promises and walk in them. So we get impatient. Just to summarize this now, we, we get impatient because of unfulfilled desires we know there's an answer in worshiping God who will meet our needs and change our desires if need be. We get impatient because of faulty beliefs, wrong thinking. What am I believing that's wrong about this situation that maybe I don't see? What does God's word say about this situation that's causing me to be impatient? Is there something I'm missing? And we get impatient because of problems, either ones that we generate ourselves or ones that are put upon us by the impatience of other people. These things cause us to be impatient. Let me close with a story that might exemplify this. When we were overseas, I wanted to fly home to be with my brother in his last days. He was dying of AIDS and I wanted to spend some time with him before, before his last days. And so I'm, I'm flying and back to the United States. The main flight started out of Biak, a little island by the place where, that we were, an international airport there. And so I'm in line for to catch my flight from Biak back to the United States. and. As we were, there were a bunch of us standing in line, and the people behind the counter came on and said, we are so sorry to announce that the, the plane coming out of Jakarta um, is, is broken down. There's maintenance problems, and we don't have a flight. There's no plane. And Biak, a little island, it's not like they had other planes sitting around. The planes are in and out. So there's no plane. There's no way. I'm flying back today. And then the attendant was telling us, and it'll be tomorrow. The, the flight, we're pretty secure that we'll have a flight tomorrow. But for today, the flight is canceled. Well, I was standing right behind three Americans because I was listening to their conversation. They had been in that area to, on a scuba diving expedition. One was, was a surgeon. Another one was a, a professor at a college. And the other one was a doctor, a, a doctor of medicine. And they went ballistic when they got this news. Other people started to filter off and you know have conversations about, okay, what are we going to do now? What's our plan now? These three pushed their way up to the desk and started just ranting and raving and yelling at the people behind the counter. And, you know, I, I'm a surgeon. I've got surgeries planned. You can't hold me here in this place. There's got to be another option. We've got to get another plane here now. Professor, the same thing. I, I teach classes that I have to be at and the doctor, I have patients that I have to see, and they're just going on and on and ranting and raving and yelling with anger at these people behind the counter who had no control over this situation. There was nothing that they could do. It wasn't their fault, but they're yelling at them. They're expressing this incredible impatience that is causing problems for everybody in the room. And I'm right behind them, and I'm, I'm going, oh, am I ever ashamed to be an American right now? It's just so embarrassing. But you see, those, those three people, they, they were totally impatient because they had these unrealized expectations and unmet desires that were based in faulty thinking, thinking that anybody else could do anything about it. And it was all rooted in these needs that they thought they had and these expectations that they had, rooted in false beliefs, and creating problems that were deeper, not just for themselves, but for everybody waiting in that room. It was pretty quiet. I mean, by the time that they were done ranting and raving, everybody in the room was listening to this conversation unfolding. Well, finally, the attendants behind the counter, 
you know, they knew they had to provide some lodging for all these, these people, and there, were, there was only a couple of hotel options, and the, the hotel rooms were quickly going to get full, so they went through the manifest, and they had to divide everybody up and partner everybody and give people roommates to make this happen, and while they were working on that, we, we tried to be patient in the midst of it. I, I felt like maybe God was giving me this divine appointment of patience, because I didn't have it, <laughs> but he was enabling me to be patient in this process. Then they announced all the roommates and where we would be staying, and guess who my roommate was? <laughs> Mark, the doctor, who was the loudest and the angriest in the bunch. But the thing is, God gave me an opportunity, because, you know, the first moment we were alone, he was like, hey, I know you're an American, you were right behind us in line, and we talked a little bit, but I noticed, where's your anger and impatience in this? How did you maintain your composure in this whole thing? And I was able to have a faith conversation and assure him, well, I can assure you it's nothing based in what I mustered up in that moment because I really wanted to get home and see my brother. I don't know how many days he has left. You know, I'm going to hurry too. And I was able to explain to him that, you know, it's all about God. I just made a choice to go to him and pray and talk to him. And the patience comes from him and from him alone. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what's causing you to be impatient about your circumstances in life or whatever that is. But one thing I can assure you, you will never come up with the patience you need for life in your own strength. It's not possible. But trusting in God can open the door for him to bring fruit of the spirit, which includes love for the people around me and patience in my circumstances. So final question. For what do you need patience? I hope maybe during this time, you've already been thinking in these terms and you already have been you know, reflecting on where you need patience right now. Because you know we always take it to application, right? What does this mean for me and what can I do about it? Where do you need patience? What is that situation or that circumstance you're facing that you desperately need God to give you the patience that you just don't have in your own strength. Well, good news, you shouldn't try to muster it up in your own strength or white knuckle through it. Trusting in God, worshiping him, believing correctly that he will meet us where we are and give us the strength for the next step. You know, maybe for you, the question is a who question. For whom do you need patience? Is there a conflict or a tension in a relationship that you'd much rather run from, get away from, you don't deserve that treatment. You don't deserve that with them. Is it possible that God wants you to go back, revisit that relationship, and in his strength, have patience for them and love for them that will bring healing and bring that place of delighting in God and knowing that he will fulfill the desires of our heart. Because when God empowers patience, we experience so much more of what he has in mind that's always so much better than what I have in mind. So what is that for you? I, I wanna encourage you right, right now in this moment, you know, God is here. We believe that he's here by his spirit. Jesus is very much in the room. I just want us to pause right now in this moment, create a little kind of altar moment around you right, right now. Have a conversation with God right now and, and talk to him about this. Whatever it is that's on your heart, I'll close this in prayer in just a moment. But for, for right now, take a moment of silence and zero in on the heart of God and talk to him about whatever it is that you are facing and what you need patience for. Drink from his well. Have an altar moment right now. I just encourage you to close your eyes and zero in on the heart of God and have a conversation with him.